Okay, so um, for next time, remember to complete the vocabulary quiz by midnight on Sunday, right? I'll send you a reminder. I promise I will let you know. I, I will open it at the right time this time and remember to let you know if it's open. Um, and yeah, there's no time limit and it's open notes, right? Just take your time with it. Um, and you're going to be reading an excerpt from uh, <clears throat> Ola Uda Equiano's uh, autobiography, uh, The Interesting Narrative. Um, so the excerpt is only about, is only about nine pages. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty intense nine pages. It's a pretty deep nine pages. Um, so I'll give you reading questions for that at the end of class. Um, now, before we get started, does anybody have any questions about anything? about assignments or about anything else going forward. Okay. So what did y'all think about what, uh, what you read for today? What are, what are your like, thoughts or impressions? Um, um, I, you know, I've read stuff like this before, you know, especially as a black man. Sure. Like, like we grow up like, knowing about this stuff. Like I remember uh -huh. being as a child watching Roots as a family night. Yeah, not a family movie, but we and like the, it was on, it was on a major network in prime time. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm like we, we watched like Ruth and like I think uh -huh. in the scene like in the trilogy I think it is there's a scene where like um where they're on the slave ship and uh -huh. they like see them underneath like where they were kept and the detailed um, description of it this time I don't know reading it it was harder to read this time I guess. Because they gave like the measurements and everything, like how specific yeah. it was built yeah. like, for that purpose. I don't know; it was harder to read this time. And that's and yeah, I mean that's a big part of Clarkson's argument, right? It's right. like you know you can't possibly keep this many human beings right. in this space, right? I mean, he notes that the smaller of the two ships he's talking about was built as a pleasure boat for the use of six people right. on the Severn River, river near, uh, near Bristol, right? And um, yeah, um, and there were, like, Clarkson's work did actually have some legal results that we'll talk about um, in a moment, although they, by, by no, the, the changes in the laws by no means rectified the basic problem. Um, anything else that you guys want to want to get out of, you want to talk about before we start discussing these, these texts in closer detail? I thought it was interesting from reading like the little write up on the authors before each one and something I didn't realize was like how ignorant the masses were about the conditions of the slave trade. I think just because uh -huh. I've grown up in like every history class you're always talking about it and they show like a diagram or a picture or and you know you're talking about uh -huh. all these things and you read books from former slaves and and so uh -huh. it just seems like, oh, well, that wealth of knowledge, like people always knew this. And it was really for a long time, kind of the people who were in the trade were the ones who knew. And the rest uh -huh. of the population was kind of sheltered like, oh, yeah, someone's enslaved. Uh -huh. But they didn't know all of the other like horrible things behind it and why Clarkson actually started writing and researching and compiling all the evidence. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that what, like one thing we'll get from Clarkson and Coleridge is that some of that blindness is a little bit willful, right? It's, you know, you don't, you don't see it because you don't want to see it. You know, it's like you want to keep sweetening your tea with cane sugar because if you live in Europe, you're not, the only other option is beet sugar and beet sugar sucks. Um, you want to keep sweetening your tea with that sugar. You want to keep that rum and that tobacco coming from the new world. Um, and so you don't want to inquire too deeply into where it comes from, right? You know, there are similar, like, we're actually, like, asking similar questions now about our own supply chains. As, you know, we see, you know, the pandemic has made, um, made it harder to get certain goods. It's got us asking questions now. So, well, where does this actually come from and who actually makes it, right? And the information was largely available all the time. But as long as we're getting stuff cheaply and conveniently, we often don't ask those kinds of questions, right? And I think that Coleridge in particular and Clarkson are trying to get people to ask these kinds of questions. Like, you know, where, where is your sugar in particular coming from, right? And is it really worth it? Yeah, Pete. 
One thing I thought was really interesting was that I always wondered, like, what, when people see the conditions, like the people on the boats, like, why uh -huh. do they continue it and stuff? So I thought reading uh -huh. Gobbets was very, like, interesting because it kind of gave you the yeah. viewpoint of someone who, like, almost encourages it. Yeah, so I yeah, was... and, and, and Cobbett himself, yeah, so, so yeah, Cobbett's arguments um, are by and large not very, not very good or very strong arguments, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's, you know, his, his piece is based on a very selective reading of scripture um, and on stoking nationalistic fears, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the, like, and, you know, Cobbett himself probably never set foot on a slave ship and saw what things were like, right? Mm -hmm. But he, you know, what he's thinking about is broader social consequences, you know, what he thinks are broader social consequences of ending the trade. Um, you know, what's it, what that's gonna mean for England and England's com uh, ability to compete with France. Um, and um, later on in Cobbett's career, this develops into a stronger concern about um, English workers specifically, although in 1802 um, he was much more conservative in his positions and wasn't quite as worried about all that. He never in his lifetime um, is uh, in favor of abolishing the slave trade. He never makes that step. But one thing that Cobbett does do in other pieces to, um, you know, play devil's advocate for some aspects of the man's personality to show that he wasn't, um, he wasn't wholly evil, right? <laughs> um, you know, um, one of the most prominent abolitionists in England was a guy by the name of William Wilberforce. And Wilberforce was a member of parliament who year after year kept introducing these bills to abolish the slave trade, and year after year they kept getting voted down. In part because, um, as we noted, um, of the anti-democratic structure of Parliament at that time, right? Um, the way Parliament was set up, the interests of the West Indian planters were always, they always had enough seats uh, to defend um, their <clears throat> interests in their, their particular position. So Wilberforce, um, in addition to being a prominent abolitionist, also owned um, a number of factories. And conditions in those factories weren't so great. Uh, pay was lousy. And so Cobbett and others accused Wilberforce of caring more about the conditions under which slaves were kept than they cared about the shitty conditions under which their own workers were laboring, right? So it's kind of, it's a little bit of a dodge, right? It's kind of a little bit of sleight of hand, right, kind of misdirecting the focus, but you know, it's also not an inaccurate criticism of people like Wilberforce. Um, and you know, and, you know a lot of these people leave behind complicated legacies, right? History is complicated and ugly. Um, human beings are often complicated and ugly. So to give you an example of this, right? So we talked about monuments last time, right? Because we were finishing up the class. And the way the Napoleonic Wars kind of changed the topography of British cities. Um, and we've had our own little stats over monuments in the US here, right? But to show that this is part of a global phenomenon, right? It's not just something that's been going on here, something that we've been debating. Um, I want to show you um, a statue that is in the city of Bristol in England. So once this comes up, right? The statue is of a guy by the name of Edward Colston. And Colston was born in 1636 and died in 1741. So, you know, a little bit before the period that we're actually studying, but oh, what the? There we go. Um, and Colston 
um, was regarded as a great philanthropist in Bristol for much of the city's history, right? You know, he, um, he used his wealth to found cultural institutions, to start schools, right? He gave a good deal to charity, to hospitals, things like that, right? But there's something problematic about the source of Colson's money, all of this money that he pumped into the city of Bristol. It was earned through his ownership of shares in the Royal Africa Company. And the Royal Africa Company um, was founded in 1660 and is in business until 1821. And just as uh, the East India Company had a kind of monopoly on the tea trade in British Dominions. The Royal Africa Company had um, a monopoly on all trade with Africa through England, right? Within English colonies. And the investors, in addition to Colston, included uh, people like the composer, um, Handel, right, the guy who wrote uh, the famous oratory of the Messiah, you know, the hallelujah chorus that people like to sing at Christmas and all that. Prominent Anglican bishops, and the royal family of Great Britain. And I probably don't need to tell you what the Royal Africa Company traded in, right? Gold, spices, coffee, valuable minerals, and slaves. Bristol, in fact, was one of the most active slave trading ports in Britain. The two most active slave trading ports were Bristol and Liverpool. Bristol in the south, Liverpool in the north. And a couple of years ago, around the same time as the, uh, the George Floyd protests were happening in, uh, like across the US, um, a group of activists in Bristol toppled the Colston statue and dumped it in the river. So for um, for a few days, this if you search the, the Edward statue of Edward Colston on Google Maps, this is what you got. <laughs> it's uh, in the middle of the Severn River, and oh, it's closed, right? <laughs> you can't go there right now. Um, but I think it's, it's since been, been fished out, and they're still trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, you know, because people's feelings around this particular monument and the history it represents are extremely complicated, um, and you know, not everyone is sure that a contextual marker or something like that is going to be enough to make memorializing Colston in such a public way all right. And it's also probably worth noting you know, just how central this trade was to British wealth and prosperity in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. How many of you have ever heard of Barclays Bank? It's well, um, one of the, the biggest British banks. It's actually one of the biggest banks in the world. Um, the, the, the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, where the Brooklyn Nets play, is, uh, you know, they have the naming rights to that uh, particular venue. Um, and yeah, Bar the Barclay brothers who founded the bank uh, were initially slave traders. And then when the trade was abolished, um, they took the money they made and found the bank. So 
what we're wrestling with here is something that's going to, that's lurking in the background of everyday British life. And I think it kind of like as Kaylee was noting in her responses to this, right? It's something that most people are dimly aware of, right? But that very relatively few people are inquiring very deeply into. So let's talk a little bit about Thomas Clarkson first here, right? So to give you a little bit of background on Clarkson. So Clarkson is um, ordained as a minister, but never has a parish. Um, and he is one of the founders of a group called the Committee for the abolition of the slave trade. And this group is founded in 1787. And one of the reasons it lacks political power at the time of its founding is that most of its members are what are called dissenters. Does anybody remember from you know a couple of sessions ago what a dissenter was? Like Protestants who didn't say that like the king of England was like the head of the church. Exactly, yeah. Dissenters are non-Anglican Protestants. So we're talking, you know, people who are either Baptists or Quakers. or Unitarians, right? Yeah, they belong to denominations that are not part of the Church of England, and they deny the, uh, the authority of the king as head of the church, right? Um, so what does this mean for them politically? What are they not allowed to do? In yeah, they can't serve in parliament because they won't take the oath that affirms that the king is head of church and state, right? So this limits their political power significantly. Now Wilberforce, I'm sorry, you said that um, Clarkson was the founder of the committee? He is a founder of the committee. A founder. Yeah, he's, he's one, of, one of the most important members. Um, so Wilberforce was, an, was angry and was a, thus able to serve in Parliament, and thus try to advance some of the group's interests. Right? But there weren't enough other members of the group who were able to get themselves into these kinds of positions of power um, to make much direct political headway. However, what they tried to do is make use of the emerging public sphere in European life more broadly and British life specifically, right? So what do we mean by the public sphere? So the public sphere is a term coined, um, I think in the 60s, by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. And what Habermas means when he talks about the public sphere is space physical or virtual, in which members of the public can debate and discuss important civic issues. And prior to the 18th century, um, a lot of these kinds of, like, there wasn't much of a meaningful public sphere in Europe, right? The public's ability to gather and discuss issues of any real political importance was largely kind of, was largely curtailed. But we see in particular the opening up of a virtual public sphere um, through, <clears throat>
the circulation of newspapers and cheap pamphlets, right? One upshot of the Protestant Reformation and of the invention of the printing press, you know, both happening roughly around the same time, the late 15th century, um, is that literacy rates go up. Right? More people are able to read. And so there's, you know, more, there's a greater audience for printed material, right? You also have improved mail service, which gives rise to what are called corresponding societies. And corresponding societies um, are essentially, you know, this is going to sound well, it sounds like it's trivializing it. I don't intend it to. Right? But yeah, they're basically groups of pen pals. Right? There are people with a particular interest or commitment who write letters to each other, um, you know, discussing um, <clears throat> issues of common importance and strategies for dealing with those issues. And a lot of corresponding societies end up developing into powerful lobbying groups. Um, as we'll discuss uh, when we, next time when we talk about Ole Uda Equiano. You also have coffee houses. Opening up um, in cities across Britain. And these become places uh, where ordinary people um, sit and debate one another and have conversations about civic issues, right? So, and these are just a few examples, right, of uh, what this kind of, this op opening public sphere looks like. Um, and this is largely where the argument over slavery is happening. It's happening in print, it's happening in letters, it's happening in, you know, people who know each other having conversations at the local coffee house. So most of the committee's efforts are directed towards influencing the public sphere and also legal work on behalf of former slaves. For example, Granville Sharp, who was a member of the committee, was a prominent lawyer in Gloucestershire. Um, the Barbados work song that I was playing at the beginning of class um, was found amongst his papers and kind of reconstructed recently by a PhD student in music. Um, but Sharp uh, acted as legal representative for a guy by the name of James Somerset, who was the first, um, the first person to challenge the legality of his enslavement in Britain. Right? He had been a slave in the West Indies, he escaped to Britain, and Sharp helped him to argue in court that um, though that once he was in when, once he was on British soil, where slavery was technically illegal, he could no longer be held as a slave. And this the, the and, um, Somerset's lawsuit was uh, successful. Right, the court sided with. So this is the environment that people like Clarkson and Cobbett and Coleridge are working in here, right? This is the, the kind of environment where they're applying their particular arguments. Now, there were three common pro-slavery arguments that were shared by most writers who didn't just take the um, straight up economic Right? It's like, well, it gets us stuff that we want, so you know, what's the problem? Um, there were people in the 18th, by the end of the 18th century, there were writers and thinkers and politicians who came and said, okay, if we want to keep doing this, then we have to put it on some kind of moral footing or moral basis, right? So we have to morally sanction it somehow. So there were three ways they did this. One, and this is what we see Cobbett doing, They argue that it's sanctioned by scripture, right? 
If we turn to William Cobbett's piece, on page 118. Right. He writes in that second paragraph there, if the purchasing slaves be now inhuman and unjust, it must always have been so. And the keeping persons in slavery so unjustly acquired must have been equally so. And your lordship must either allow the purchase and possession of slaves to be consistent with the law of God, unless you can show when that law was abrogated, or acknowledge that the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, saints, confessors, fathers, and bishops of the Church of God, both under the law and the gospel, who have purchased, sold, or possessed slaves, bondmen and bondmaids, have acted with cruelty, oppression, inhumanity, and injustice. Such an opinion would be directly contrary to those doctrines which your lordship teaches, and which you and Mr. Wilberforce profess to believe. So, What's the argue, the basic argument here Cobbett is making? That since slavery was in scripture, it must be condoned by it. Yeah, because, right, Moses and Abraham weren't bad guys, right? Right. So if you want to say that slave owners are bad now, that owning slaves is bad now, you have to say that it was bad then, too. And thus all of the prominent biblical figures who owned slaves must have been wicked men, right? This is a pretty common argument of this type. Um, and it is one um, that does not, basically what he's making is a kind of universalist argument, right? Is that um, all things at all times are more or less the same. All conditions at all times are entirely the same. Um, all forms of bonded labor are entirely the same. Um, and thus, because they could do it back in ancient Israel, we should be allowed to do it now. Right? Otherwise, you're going against Scripture. You know, rather than acknowledging, okay, maybe the biblical patriarchs were human beings and also had a couple of little moral blind spots, right? The second argument that you often heard from people who were trying to put slavery on some kind of moral footing was that Native African rulers were much more brutal than European slave masters, which was dependent on kind of thinking of African societies as inherently less civilized um, and less advanced than European societies. Right? So in order to make this kind of argument, you are kind of like dehumanizing and degrading the societies that people are being taken from by suggesting that they're, you know, that they're, they're primitive and cruel, right? that they're not sufficiently human. Doing them a favor. Yeah, which leads into what the third major argument was, was that the evils of slavery, right, and people making this argument acknowledged that it was an evil, were compensated for by the slaves usually forced conversion to Christianity. So yeah, this is of a piece with that second argument, where like as Ryland said, you know, the, it's the we're doing them a favor really argument, right? Whether they want that favor or not, Right? Whether they asked for that favor or not is completely irrelevant. And I think that we can see some of this in Clarkson's discussion of Christianity and heathenism, right? How does his, like, and Clark, Clarkson, by the way, is um, devout, right? 
he is, even though he is not a practicing minister, he was trained for the ministry, and he was, a, you know, he was an Anglican deacon, right? So this is not someone who is, you know, like a wild-eyed atheist, you know, running around, you know, spouting, um, you know, spouting anti-church propaganda, right? But as he has this conversation with the imaginary African. What is this African's opinion of Christians and heathens? You mean in the, the Clarkson? Yeah, the Clarkson okay. piece, yeah. Um, the Christians that were coming to enslave those people, you know, they were calling themselves Christians and like preaching or like saying, who are basically preaching this word of uh -huh. their values, but then they call the Africans heathens. Right. <laughs> but like, yeah. like they were um, confused. I don't know how to explain that. I can hear it in my head. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think you know what I mean. I th yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, yeah let's, uh, yeah let, let, let's try to talk it out here. Right? Yeah. So what do we usually usually mean when we call someone a heathen? Do we typically mean anything good by it? <laughs> It's usually a pejorative, right? right? Yeah, like so what what does it mean in like common conversation? It's probably not a word we use that much anymore. But if you refer to someone as a heathen, what do you usually mean about them? Like really bad behavior and probably unchurched. Yeah, so yeah. Cool. Uh-huh. They're monsters. Yeah. Yeah, but like you know, I think it's a word that like we'll sometimes use about little kids when they misbehave, right? You know, like you miserable little heathen. <laughs> it stops from saying miserable little shits. <laughs> but yeah, but like we usually use it to, to infer like wildness and barbarism, right? And ignorance. Savages. Yeah. People who do not know the true way. They have not been brought to the true way, right? Whatever that is. But let's, yeah, let's look at the way the African in Clarkson's piece here describes the Christians. Right? Can I get somebody to start reading, from, uh, reading for us from um, page 99, the last paragraph? We'll start with that. Now, as I have mentioned the name of Christians. And now, as I have mentioned the name of Christians, a name by which the Europeans distinguished themselves, distinguished themselves from us, I could wish to be informed of the meaning which such an appellation may convey. They consider themselves as men, but as unfortunate Africans whom they term heathens as the beasts that serve us. But uh, how different is the fact? What is Christian, Christianity but a system of murder and oppression? The cries and yells of the unfortunate people who are now soon to, to embark for the reason of servitude have already appeared. Yes, have already pierced my heart. Have you not heard me sigh while we have been talking? Do you not see the tears that now filter down my cheeks? And yet these hardened Christians are not, unable to be moved at all. Nay, they, they will scourge them amidst their groans and even smile while they are torturing them to death. Happy, happy heathenism, which can detest the vices of Christianity and feel for the distresses of mankind. Okay, so what kind of impression of Christianity is this imaginary African? conveying here. It's hypocritical in a way. Okay, yeah. Well, the, does he know it's hypocritical? No. Clarkson would because Clarkson is familiar with the tenets of Christian religion, right? right. Mm -hmm. But for like from the perspective of this imaginary African, right, all he knows of Christians is these pale-skinned people who land on the Gold Coast, um, you know, commit violence and murder and then take people away, right? That's what, that's what this looks like to him. So what Clarkson is trying to do through the use of the African as um, uh, kind of like really like he's kind of like an imaginative device here, right? Um, he's trying to defamiliarize.
certain um, well-known objects and concepts, right? This is something we're going to see Equiano do a lot of, right? He's going to you know, show you what a lot of things that we think of as everyday and normal look like to someone who's never seen them before, right? So <clears throat> part of the question that Clarkson is asking and trying to answer here is, what does Christianity look like to someone whose only experience of Christians is these slave traders. And to, to this guy, it looks like murder and oppression, right? So let's continue here. Let, let's look at um, Clarkson's response, his defense of Christianity to this imaginary African. Can, can somebody start with, but I reply, you were totally mistaken. But I reply, you were totally mistaken. Uh, Christianity is the most perfect and lovely of moral systems. It blesses even the hand of persecution itself and returns good for evil. But the people against whom you so justly declaim are not Christians. They are infidels. They are monsters. They are out of the common course of nature. Their countrymen at home are generous and brave. They support the sick, the lame, and the blind. They fly to the succor of the distressed. Mm -hmm. They have noble and stately buildings uh, for the sole purpose of benevolence. They are, in short, of all nations, the most remarkable for humanity and justice. Okay, thank you. So what's Clarkson's defense here of Christianity? You go. Okay, he said that um, true Christianity is not what these people that are coming to take away the African. It's not what, uh -huh. not what it's actually about. These people yeah. are, they claim, they come at and claim as Christians, but they're actually monsters. They're uh -huh. the heathens that they're coming right. to. Right. The, the, these are people who have perverted these good doctrines, right? right? And that if you actually go to a Christian country, he's saying, right? You'll see benevolence abound. Right? Remember that benevolence in the 18th century is um, a big key moral concept, right? You know, that we develop benevolence, we develop um, good feelings, generous feelings towards other human beings um, through sympathy generated by our senses, right? But why then, replies the honest African, do they suffer this? Why is Africa a scene of blood and desolation? Why are her children wrested from her to administer to the luxuries and greatness of those whom they never offended? And why are these dismal cries in vain? So is Clarkson's argument about the perfection of Christianity allowed to stand here? What's the African's question then to Clarkson? Like, if they're so benevolent, why aren't they that way towards us? Yeah, if they're so benevolent, if they're so good and kind, if they're so moral, why do they allow their countrymen to treat us this way, right? And then I think Clarkson kind of goes and undercuts his own response here. Like, you were talking, Kaylee, uh, about um, the lack of awareness um, that a lot of the public would have had, right? So can you read for us from Alas, I Reply Again, Can the Cries and Groans? Sure. And just go, go to the end of the passage, right, to, to uh, interrupt the, to end with interrupted the discourse. Okay. Alas, I reply again, can the cries and groans with which uh, the air now trembles be heard across the extensive continent? Can the southern winds convey them to the air of Britain? And if, uh, if they could reach the generous Englishman at home, they would pierce his heart as they have pierced your own. He would sympathize with you in your distress. He would be enraged at the conduct of his countrymen and resist their tyranny. But here a shriek unusually loud accompanied with a dreadful rattling of chains interrupted the discourse. Okay, thank you. So what's going on here? Is, is Clarkson even permit, does Clarkson even permit himself, right? Remember, this is all seen in his own imagination, right? Does he permit himself to finish his defense of his countrymen? No. Why not? Is he, in a way, taking responsibility as well? 
What, uh, okay, um, why, why would you, why would you from, say that? As being from Britain as well, like these people are coming uh-huh. from Britain. Yeah. Like, and he, him being from Britain, is he taking responsibility as well for it and saying that um, if the the people of Britain or the real Christians of Britain mm-hmm. could hear the cries and the pain from the Africans, uh-huh. you know, they would they would be they would sympathize with them. Sure. It's hard once you know what's happening mm-hmm. to ever justify not speaking up and not saying something sure. about it. And I think, uh-huh. like, even the people who had found out about it or had heard even some of it, it was almost like, well, if you heard, why haven't you told other people? Like, uh-huh. people share news, and especially right. bad news, usually. <laughs> I mean, like, people will yeah. soak people up love, bad news faster news. than yeah. good news, usually. <laughs> There are many who delight. I don't know if you know of a German, there's a German word, schadenfreude, right? It literally means uh, taking pleasure in the misfortune of others. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, like, I think you're, you're all thinking along the right lines here. But I think what, what, what really gets me is that what interrupts Clarkson, like when he's talking, was like, how can we hear the groans and cries from, uh, from coming from Africa all the way in Britain? And then what interrupts him? Shrieks in the chains. Yeah, a shriek unusually loud in the rattling of chains, right? So, in the end here, does he buy his own argument? No. He's kind of calling bullshit on himself, right? And yeah, I think he is taking responsibility as well here. Um, but yeah, if I think what, like what, what he is saying is like, like no, like we, we know, right? There's no way we can't know. Like he's calling me as one of the people that were saying, like, well, we didn't know, we, didn't, yeah. we had no idea what's going on, but, like, no, you hear it, you, you know what's going on. You, yeah. you, know, you know you're getting this abundance of sugar and rum and tobacco, uh-huh. but you know you're not growing it. I mean, there's no way <laughs> Britain can grow it, so yeah. how do you think you're getting it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, yeah. Where, where, where do you think all this is coming from? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's right. I think that's the basic direction that he's taking this in. And, you know, by the way, like, I, I do want to just point out, again, some of the legal influence that Clarkson's work does have, right? Um, so <clears throat> Clarkson points out in the latter part of this excerpt that you read, um, a particularly cruel or a particular instance of cruelty um, called the Zong incident. So were you all able to gather what happened aboard the Zong in September 1781? Um, yes, um, the slaves, they were dying with the, the conditions. Uh-huh. The smell, like, they were basically they were basically in a big sty, but with people. But, um, yeah. They were dying of their like uh-huh. the smile and uh, everything, and he had lost so much of them that the trip was basically in vain. Uh-huh. Um, and so he wanted to throw the rest off so he could collect insurance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the captain of the ship is trying to cut his losses. Right. Right. And he's like, well, not enough of the, not enough of them are going to survive the passage here. So I'm just going to throw them all overboard and say there wasn't enough water, right? Even though, as Clarkson notes, he hadn't put, the ship hadn't been put on, on um, emergency water rations, uh, which is what would usually be done if there was a lack of water. And, you know, even like while he was throwing people off the ship, it started raining, right? So there's no, there was no justification for doing this except that he wanted to collect insurance money. Now, the courts did convict the captain of the Zong. But what do you think they convicted him of? Did they convict him, do you think, of murder? No. What do you think they convicted him of? Like insurance fraud? Yeah, exactly. He was convicted of insurance fraud. Yeah. 
because the law didn't view a slave as a person. It viewed a slave as property. So the captain was convicted over the fraud that he tried to commit on his partners and his insurance company. But when Clarkson drew attention to this particular incident, it did actually result a few years later after intense lobbying in 1788 in what was called the Slave Act, which limited the number of slaves who could be transported in a single ship based on the size of said ship. So while Clarkson was not able to improve the legal status of slaves, his arguments were at least slowly able to improve their material conditions. And this is actually something I, I want to point to here. There's a, uh, there's a French anthropologist um, who has made a study of slavery and slave cultures. His name is Claude Mayassou. And I'm never really quite sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, because that is very, very, very French. And uh, Masu makes a distinction between what he calls the condition of slavery and the state of slavery. So when he talks about condition, what he means are the material conditions under which a slave lives. Are they treated kindly or cruelly? Are they beaten or not? Um, you know, are they fed properly? Are they given a comfortable place to sleep? So on and so forth, right? But what he regards as more important is the state of slavery, right? That is someone's legal status as another person's property. And Mayasu and others argue that we often tend to get overly hung up on the condition part of this without thinking enough about the state, right? That, you know, we, we sometimes become, you know, sometimes people are kind of like willing to forgive the, you know, the legal status of people as property if, you know, they were kept in reasonably humane and comfortable. Right? But yeah, Mayasu argues that the real problem here is laws that allow people to keep other people as property. And that's something that, Cl uh, that Clarkson's work wasn't really able to challenge or dislodge, right? Now, we haven't talked at all about Coleridge, and I do want to um, bring him in here in part because we're going to be reading more Coleridge. Um, we're going to be reading um, one of his poems, which um, one popular reading of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is that it is actually influenced by um, Coleridge's reflections on uh, the slave trade. Um, but <clears throat> Coleridge knew Clarkson. Um, while he wasn't a member of Clarkson's group, um, they shared a lot of similar ideas. But as a young man, Coleridge was a political and religious radical. And he and his friend Robert Southey, uh, who wrote the anti-war poem, The Victory, that we, wrote, uh, that we read for the last time, um, had this idea to found a utopian community in Pennsylvania that they called Pantisocracy, which means something like government of all. However, in order to found this utopian community, they needed money to buy land and supplies, or they needed to raise funds. So Coleridge attempted to raise funds 
by giving a series of lectures um, that people would pay to attend um, on subjects like the slave trade. And like the speech that he gives um, that you read for today was actually delivered in Bristol, uh, which was pretty damn courageous <laughs> given that Bristol was an enormous center of slave trading. Um, and what's the main thing that Coleridge is urging his listeners to do in this speech? What does he want them to do or to give up? Sugar. Yeah. He's trying to get them to boycott sugar. Why sugar? What has he got against sugar? Unnecessary, and it was like a slave crop. Yeah, it's it's a luxury, right? You don't really like. No one really needs it. And it is, as you said, one of the key slave crops produced in the New World, and right? particularly in the in the West Indies. And uh, the cane plantations were particularly. Everything okay? I'm so sorry. It's a, no. It's, it's usually on silent, and I thought it might have been warm, so I just wanted to turn it it's, off. It's, it's fine, it happens. I, I am frequently awakened in the night by an amber alert from somewhere across the state. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 pick the, I pick the phone up, I curse a little bit, I hurl against the wall. <laughs> I can go back to sleep, everything's good. Sorry. <laughs> it's, to, it's totally fine. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I want to look in particular here at the last paragraph of Coleridge's uh, speech, um, because I think it's the one that relates most closely to some of the other themes we've been discussing here. So can I get a volunteer to uh, read for us on the top of page 117, starting with, there is observable among the many a false and bastard sensibility. disturb the selfish enjoyments. Other miseries, though equally certain, far more horrible, they not only do not endeavor to remedy, they support, they fatten on them. Provided the dung hill be not before their parlor window, they are well content to know that it exists, and that it is the hotbed of their pestilent luxuries. To this grievous, grievous failing, we must attribute the frequency of wars and the countenance of the slave trade. The merchant finds no argument against it in his ledger. The citizen at the crowded feast is not nauseated by the stench and filth of the slave vessel. The fine lady's nerves are not shattered by the shrieks. She sips a beverage sweetened with human blood, even while she is weeping over the refined sorrows of Werner or of Clementina. Mm -hmm. Sensibility is not benevolence. Nay, by making us trembling, tremblingly alive to trifling misfortunes, it frequently prevents it and induces effeminate and cowardly selfishness. Our own sorrows, like the princes of hell and Milton's pandemonium, sit thrown bulky and vast, while the miseries of our fellow creatures dwindle into pygmy forms and are crowded an innumerable multitude into some dark corner of the heart. There is one criterion by which we may always distinguish benevolence from mere sensibility. Benevolence impels to action and is accompanied by self-denial. Okay, thank you. So what philosophical moral idea that we've discussed in the past is Coleridge calling into question here. Yeah, go ahead, Peggy. It's he's basically saying that even though you may be like feel sympathy towards yeah. them, doesn't mean that you're gonna make action into it, basically, uh -huh. or like, you know, do anything generous for them. I guess. Yeah, that like being able to like to feel someone's sorrows, right? Mm -hmm. When they're immediately present to you doesn't necessarily encourage you to act on that person's behalf, right? In fact, even like, you know, um, Adam Smith, who wrote the theory of moral sentiments, argued that you know, we feel sympathy with another person when they're suffering because we're imagining ourselves in their place, right? So it is essentially a selfish feeling, right? Why do we sympathize with the dead? You know, their problems are over, right? 
but we sympathize with them, we feel sorry for them because we know we wouldn't like to be confined to a little pine box buried in the ground, right? And that's kind of exactly the, the kind of idea that Coleridge is calling out here. So like, no, like, you can't just, you, you know, like, like, feeling sympathy with characters in books that you read about, right, or things that are immediately present to your senses doesn't make you a good person. In fact, it can actually desensitize you to the suffering that is actually happening out there in the world that you're not paying attention to. And so, like, this is of a piece with his arguments about the monk, right, where he was arguing that, you know, too much sensibility, right, a person of too strong sensibility, when they read something like the monk, it's going to warp their moral development. And he's kind of developed that idea here, uh, the, the idea here right, that, like, look, like, if you're, if your morals are coming from nothing but sense impressions or stories that you're reading in books, then there's something wrong with you anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> that your morals are already warped. And you're not learning to be benevolent unless you're actually willing to take action on behalf of another, like to end another person's suffering. I just I love the phrase. Um, what, what is the uh, provided the dunghill be not before their parlor window, they are well content to know that it exists and that it is the hotbed of their pestilent luxuries. Right? Pestilent is such a great word. We don't use that often enough. Okay, so um, we're going to be continuing a lot of this conversation when we talk about Equiano, um, who is not only a prominent abolitionist himself, um, but is also um, the author of one of the first modern autobiographies in the English language. In fact, like of the, the earliest modern autobiographies written in the English language, almost all of them are written by black men living in England in the late 18th century. So um, just interesting historical fact for you. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything before I give you the reading questions for everyone? Okay, great. bathroom that some of my colleagues get salty if students use. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, they're the one in the breezeway is the one students are supposed to use. 